so now just to very briefly uh, introduce you to Lee. Um, so it's a great pleasure and a bit of a first for CM, I think, uh, to, um, to have uh, Lee here. So um, Lee Ridley is also known as a Lost Voice guy. Uh, and some of you might have uh, seen um, some of his YouTube videos or his blog or things like that um, a while ago. And it seems he's been very busy <laughs> since we first <laughs> heard about him and now. And uh, hopefully we'll find out a bit about um, what he's been up to. So um, Lee, you describe yourself as a as um, the, uh, probably the first comedian to use a communication aid. Uh, and yeah, that's it really, over to you to tell us. Hello ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for that lovely welcome. It felt good. In fact, I haven't felt that good since the doctors told my mother I was a special child. Seriously though, it's great to be here. I'd like to thank everyone for coming. I know you all usually watch EastEnders or the football on a Sunday afternoon. So I appreciate you giving me your time. Luckily for me, I can still watch the football on my iPad while I talk to you. Don't worry, I will try not to give away the score. Anyway, I'm sure you don't want to listen to my monotone voice for the next hour or so. That is why I have brought my alter ego along with me today. Her name is Lucy, and I'll introduce her in a moment. Basically, I thought it would be nice if Lucy asked me some questions, which I would then answer for you. Some of the questions have been asked by yourselves via Twitter, some I have made up myself, and the others are those questions that I'm already sick of answering. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lucy. Thank you, Lee. And thanks for inviting me here today. I'm looking forward to getting to know all about you. I guess I'd better start by asking you about your background. Well, I'm 31 years old and I'm from Newcastle, in the Northeast. I studied journalism at university, and I currently work in the media team at Sunderland City Council. I have also worked for the BBC and for a number of local newspapers in the Northeast. In my spare time, I also do stand-up comedy. I first started doing that in February of this year, and it's been going really well. In fact, I might do some for you later, if you ask nicely. And how did you end up not being able to speak? That's a bit of a personal question for this early in the interview, Lucy, but fair enough. I was very ill when I was six months old, and I developed cerebral palsy as a result. In my case, it meant that I lost my speech, I walk very funny, and my right side of my body is weaker than my left. That's a bit of a personal question. Sorry to hear that. But isn't a career in journalism and stand-up comedy a bit of a weird choice for someone who can't communicate very well? Yes. Yes, it is. Are you going to elaborate on that? I guess I just never saw my disability as something that could hold me back. I've always loved writing and being a journalist was the only career that I ever wanted to do. I was lucky that I had a great English teacher who taught me to follow my dreams. I'll never forget how much he pushed me to achieve my best. Obviously I hated him for it at the time. But now I can appreciate what he did for me. Don't get me wrong. I knew that getting a job in journalism would be harder because of my disability. I didn't see that as a reason not to try though. I guess I just had my heart set on it. I was lucky to have very supportive family and friends too. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for them. 
there never stopped me from doing what I wanted and were always the first to help out. Like I said, I never saw my disability as a barrier to doing anything. I was always going to be a journalist, I was always going to go to university, and I was always going to be independent. My disability is a big part of me, but I've never let it rule my life. Some people would say that's brave or courageous, but I don't believe it is. And I hate being called that. There's plenty of people who deserve to call brave more than me. I'm just a guy trying to get on with his life. As for why I decided to try stand-up comedy, I guess I'm just a bit mental. <laughs> so, what made you decide to try to do stand-up comedy? I've always been a big fan of comedy, and I love going to watch stand-up comedy myself. I'd always say that, if I could talk, that would probably be my dream job. I never expected to do it, though. I just didn't think it was possible. Then, some friends said that it might work, and that I should try it. I thought they were crazy at first. But the idea stuck in the back of my mind. Eventually I decided to give it a try, because I knew I'd regret it if I didn't. It seems like I was right. Even after agreeing to do it, I was worried that it wouldn't work. I was scared that people wouldn't be able to understand me, and I'd just be standing there telling jokes to myself. I was worried it wouldn't work from a technology point of view either. Once my first gig was out of the way though, I was much more confident about it all. Obviously it must be harder doing stand-up comedy with a communication aid. What problems do you face? The main problem is trying to get it to say things correctly. For example, it can't say I pad, so I have to spell it a different way. I also have to put random punctuation in the middle of sentences, so that it breaks it up and makes it easier to understand. So, once I write my material, I usually have to go through it again and check that it sounds okay. There has been times when I have had to change my jokes, just because it doesn't sound right. The sound can be a bit of a nightmare as well. I have to sound check before every gig. Sometimes it is fine, but other times it is not the best. Then I have to mess about with it, until it sounds okay. I've learned a lot about how all these wires work in the past couple of months. Would you say the communication aid affects timing? How do you structure your material to counter this? Definitely. It was one of my main concerns when I first started doing stand-up. And it is still something I have to think a lot about. It's slightly harder for me to stop in the middle of a joke and allow laughter. It's trial and error, really. If I know a laugh is coming, I can get ready to pause it. Every audience is different, though. Sometimes I put random punctuation in a joke, so that there's time for people to laugh too. It's just a case of knowing how to use things to your advantage. I'd like to think I'm getting better at it. How do you go about preparing and delivering your sets? How much of the material is entered ahead of the performance? And to what extent are you able to react and respond to things that the audience might say or do? I write the material beforehand and copy and paste them into the iPad. Then I just press the jokes I wanted to speak during the gig. Obviously this is pretty limited in terms of audience interaction, but I'd like to try to do more of this in the future. It just depends on how fast I can type. I have got some comebacks stored, just in case I get heckled.
What are the main things that inform your material in terms of subject matter and specific topics? How would you describe the humor of a typical Lost Voice Guy show? My humor is very dark and twisted, I would say. I am influenced a lot by comedians such as Ross Noble and the League of Gentlemen, which explains a lot. I mostly concentrate on my disability and the funny side of it. I enjoy taking the piss out of myself. I realize that this may make some people feel awkward, but I think that helps me. Because I base it on myself, I think I get away with it more. When people realize this, they tend to come on side. How do audiences react when they realize you use a communication aid? I think it varies, really. A bit like it does in real life. Sometimes you can hear the gasp come from the audience when I walk onto the stage. I think that helps, though, because they don't know what to expect. So when I hopefully make them laugh, I think they enjoy it more. It can't get any worse than in real life when people think I'm deaf as well and insist on writing everything down or start shouting at me for no reason. By getting up on stage, I'd like to think that I'm educating people that disabled people are just the same as everyone else. I honestly believe that some people think that disabled people aren't allowed a sense of humor. Obviously, I don't really care what they think, but if it helps change someone's view, then it must be a good thing. Have you given much thought to having a custom-made voice to do various tones or emphasis on words to enhance your act? I'd love to have a voice that isn't as posh as this one. Although I think it makes it funnier. I've thought about having a Geordie accent, but I'm not sure if I would like it or not. I've sounded similar to this all my life, so it would sound weird, I think. I'm also not sure if it's even possible at the moment. I definitely want to use different tones and stuff, if I can, in the future. I just think I can't express myself properly by only using this voice. It's very hard to sound excited or sarcastic, for example. I guess it all depends on what the technology has in store for us. And how does the iPad compare to your very first communication aid? It's certainly a lot smaller for a start. I think I got my first communication aid when I was about eight. Before that, I just used sign language. Obviously, this was a very limited way of communicating, though. I think my first communication aid was called a touch talker, and it was pretty massive. I also remember being reluctant to use it. I can't quite remember why. I just remember always giving my speech therapist a hard time. I apologize to you all now. All I can remember is having to carry this suitcase around with me and then having to try to use it as well. I appreciated my speech therapist in the end. I think I only saw the benefits when I finally had a reason to use it. Such as in social situations, when I couldn't just rely on sign language. Thankfully, technology has moved on since then. Now, I use a light writer for day-to-day -day communication. It's a brilliant device and it's made me so much more independent. I especially like the fact that it has two screens, so that other people can read it if they need to. The voices have got better as well. I dread to think what the voice on the touch talker was like. If I'm honest, I didn't really like this voice at first. I think I had got used to the old voice on the light triter. I think I'm getting more used to it now though. What do you look for in a communication device? If I'm honest, 
The light writer has just about everything I need. And I'm not just saying that because I am here. I'm not looking for anything fancy. As long as I can communicate effectively, then I'm happy. I especially like the fact that it has two screens. That makes it a lot easier in certain situations. I like how portable it is too. Although, I am still using quite an old carry case, because I haven't found anything better recently. The speech on it is good too. It is pretty clear and understandable. It would be nice to make it more personal, but maybe one day that will happen. It also seems to survive all the times I have dropped it by accident, which is handy as well. What feature would you like to see in a communication device? As I have said, I'd love it if I could be able to express myself more. At the moment, it's pretty hard to try to sound excited or sarcastic with the current range of voices. I'd like to be able to explore tone of voice more. This would be especially useful in my comedy routine. I'd also like to have something a bit smaller so that I could carry it around easier. As I don't want to compromise on the quality of the speech though, I realize that this is probably a bit unrealistic. Looking at the bigger picture, I think I'd like to be more aware of developments in this area. I just think that once people have left school and have been sorted with a device, they are just left to get on with it. This was certainly the case for me. It's only recently that I have found out about products that I may have been interested in trying out. Was there any aspect of the recent Olympics in which more people like you could have been involved? Well, I wouldn't have minded Stephen Hawking's job in the opening ceremony. <laughs> Seriously though, that's quite a tough one to answer. I think that I would have liked to have seen more of a presence on television in general. But I'm not sure how they could have fitted in with the actual Olympics. Thank you, Lee. You're a very interesting and intelligent guy. <laughs> now can you please do a little routine for us? I suppose so. <laughs> but only if you introduce me. Even though I am already on stage. Oh, okay, if you insist. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lost Voice Guy. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Are you all very well? I guess I better start by introducing myself, because one or two of you are looking very confused. <laughs> Believe it or not, my name isn't really Lost Voice Guy. My parents were never mean enough to do something like that. At least that's what they told me to say whenever the nice lady from social services visited. In reality, they kept me locked in a room upstairs to hide me from everyone else. The local people were a bit afraid of me. They only let me out on special occasions. In fact, Anne Frank had it pretty easy compared to me. Incidentally, my diary is available to buy after the gig. Anyway, my real name is Lee, and it's nice to meet you all. I got the nickname Lost Voice Guy while I was at school. It was a very cruel thing to call me, I know. It really knocked my confidence and I hardly ever went out in the playground because of it. But the teachers insisted on calling me it. <laughs> if only they could see me now. Of course, they can't 
because I went to school a long time ago and they're all dead. Anyway, I'm here tonight to be the token disabled comedian. And I am here to tick some boxes and make you all feel awkward. I'm looking forward to it. I always like to start with a game. Let me test your powers of observation. Raise your hand if you can tell that I have a slight disability. It's the hair, isn't it? It's a dead giveaway, really. Or maybe it's the shoes. I always wear stupid shoes. My mother told me not to wear them. She said, Lee, do you know what? Those shoes make you look disabled. Please don't wear them. My mother doesn't sound anything like that, by the way. If she did, she would have a job on Radio 4. I've no idea why I use that voice. Before we go any further, let's deal with the elephant in the room. And I don't mean that fat man I've just seen going to the toilet. I know what you were all thinking when you saw me come on stage. Don't worry about it. It's fine. It happens all the time and I'm used to it by now. You were thinking here comes another wanker with his eye pad. You'd be mistaken. I'm a disabled wanker with an eye pad. The difference being that I paid for the iPad with my benefit money. Don't tell David Cameron. He still thinks I can't walk. Still have bad eyesight. And have a problem with my bladder. Unfortunately for those closest to the stage, one of those facts is actually true. There should be a bucket down there somewhere. Please, could one of you hold it for me in case of emergency? I'm usually a pretty good shot. Cheers. Let's face it though, Dave isn't a big fan of disabled people. I'm sure he thinks I'm going to wake up one day and not be disabled anymore. Or maybe even hopes I don't wake up at all. It kind of gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling that I disappoint Dave every morning. The posh fucker. In case you were still in any doubt, I really am disabled. It's definitely not just really good acting. And I'm not just in it for the parking space. I lost my voice when I was very young and I haven't found it since. Don't you just hate it when that happens? I've looked everywhere for it. Down the back of the chair, in the washing machine, everywhere. On the bright side, I did find the television remote control, three pound and change and a used rubber johnny. That's now safely back in my wallet. Don't worry though, you can't catch it from me. It just means that you are better not get stuck behind me on the stairs if there's a fire. And that I get the best seats on buses. It's a small price to pay. When I realized I'd never be able to talk again, I was speechless. I began to try to communicate through the medium of dance. A bit like Strictly Come Dancing crossed with Give Us a Clue. People just thought I was taking an epileptic fit. Let me tell you, you get asked some really strange questions when you were disabled, though. My disability is called cerebral palsy. Recently, I was asked what sort of cerebral palsy I had. 
I wasn't even aware that there was different brands of it. I have definitely not got any designer brand of cerebral palsy. I think I picked mine up from Georgia Tasda. <laughs> Whenever I'm asked what sort of cerebral palsy I have, I always want to say I've got the bad kind. I don't know what they expect me to say. Next, they will be asking me to rate my cerebral palsy on a scale from 1 to 10. 10 being really bad, and 1 being a benefit cheat, appearing on the Jeremy Kyle show. <laughs> Fortunately, I have the kind of cerebral palsy that means I can't speak. This act would be a bit shit otherwise. <laughs> I had been called many different names in the past. Just last week someone called me physically challenged, which I always thought was a game on the crystal maze. <laughs> of course, other names have not been as nice. In fact, I'm sick of getting pointed at, laughed at, looked at strangely, treated as if I am stupid and called names just because I am different. It's not even my fault that I'm from Newcastle. <laughs> Don't worry though, I have a name for all of you too. I call you the not yet disabled. <laughs> Just you wait. One day you will dribble, you will have to be fed, your dinner, and you won't be able to wipe your own bottom. <laughs> Who will be laughing then? <laughs> Obviously not me, because I'll be even worse. In fact, I'll probably be trying to kill myself in Switzerland. Good times. As you can see, most of my jokes write themselves. But that's the beauty of autocorrect on the iPad. Of course, autocorrect isn't always my friend. For those of you who don't know, Autocorrect is when the iPad tries to guess what you are typing and changes it for you. As you can imagine, this can become pretty annoying and slightly embarrassing when you use it as a communication aid. For example, I asked my mother if she wanted help booking her trip to China the other day. Sadly, it decided to say, do you want help booking vagina? It got even more awkward when she said yes. <laughs> On a similar note, I asked my best friend if he had a pen I could borrow recently. I didn't expect it to say, can I borrow your penis? <laughs> we are no longer friends. <laughs> it has ruined other relationships as well. I once tried telling my girlfriend, who I loved very much, that I'd buy her a castle. Turns out, she wasn't impressed when it said, I'd buy her a casket. <laughs> That's not what ruined the relationship, though. Ironically, she died about a month later. I got thrown out of a paint shop when I said I wanted to defecate in the living room. Of course, I meant decorate, but by then it was too late. The shit had already hit the fan. <laughs> Literally. And who can forget the time I told my sister I wanted to tuck her children into bed. I'm sure you can all guess what that was changed to. It earned me the nickname Gary Glitter. As you can see, you have to be careful what you type. It's enough to give anyone a pancake attack. I realize that my own voice doesn't really suit me. I look young, trendy and down with the kids, but my voice sounds like it belongs on a children's storytelling program. You may be wondering why I chose to sound like a posh version of Robocop. Let me demonstrate. The alternatives were not much better. I didn't really want to sound like this. 
and I really, really didn't want to sound like this. Und sprechen mit einem Akzent Deutsch war nicht hinnehmbar. I do need to set a few things straight. Firstly, I'm not drunk and this is actually how I walk all the time. Despite what embarrassed parents might tell their children when they ask awkward questions as I walk past. I did spend eight years as an alcoholic in a vain attempt to correct this issue. <laughs> thinking that if I drank enough, I'd walk straight. Turns out it just aggravated the bladder issue further. <laughs> the second thing I need to point out is this. I hate that we have so many politically correct words to describe disabled people now. When I went to school, I honestly went to a school with spastics in its name. They certainly knew how to make us feel good about ourselves. Now it's all special needs, special schools, special Olympics. I don't know what the fuck is so special about me. That is why it always alarms me when I hear about special forces going to war. <laughs> Let's be realistic. You wouldn't want me to be guiding you through a minefield or trying to talk a suicide bomber out of blowing themselves up. However, if you gave me a gun, at least the Americans would have someone else to blame for friendly fire. <laughs> And last but not least, I need to point out this. I am not related to Stephen Hawking in any way. However, I do hate the way people take the piss out of the way he speaks. I can really synthesize with him. <laughs> I am also single. Yes, I know, it surprises me too. I have tried finding a girlfriend. Let's be honest, none of us want to be left on the shelf. And I don't mean the one in Tesco. I mean the one in the great big dating supermarket of life. The one where the most desirable people have already been taken. The cheapest have been used and brought back for a refund. And the rest of us just sit there like Tesco owned brand red sauce. Not as tasty and hardly ever picked up. Dating is hard though, especially when you're disabled. I would try speed dating, but by the time it took me to tie a sentence, it would be time to move on to the next person. I'd not need my future wife, but I'd improve my typing speed. I've tried joining uniformdating.com as well. But apparently dressing up in a Nazi uniform is against their terms and conditions. I salute them for that. I got the train to the gig this evening. I always like to sit in those seats for disabled people. It's just easier to get off. Anyway, I was in that seat and was about halfway here when another disabled person got on and asked me to move. I'll be honest, I didn't realize I'd be playing disabled, top, trumps when I got on or I would have dressed more retarded. Needless to say I didn't move. Who cares if he was both blind and deaf? I was there first. It was very awkward. He couldn't see that I was still there. And I couldn't tell him I wasn't moving because I can't speak. He wouldn't have heard me anyway. In the end, I had to throw his guide dog a stick. I didn't mean for them to end up under the train. 
I decided to get a taxi to the venue. I checked beforehand and it didn't look that far. I thought I could easily afford it. The taxi driver had other ideas, however. I think he must have seen me coming and decided that I must be thick, as well as disabled. This was confirmed when he started shouting every word slowly at me. I could have told him to stop, but to be honest, it was very amusing. <laughs> Especially as I still couldn't understand his accent. Anyway, I ended up taking the longest taxi ride I've ever taken. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, it cost an absolute fortune. In fact, I could have bought Greece with that sort of money. Maybe it didn't help that I was confusing the taxi driver by pretending to be the satellite navigation system, though. <laughs> After 200 yards, bear left. Well done. At the roundabout, take the second exit. Or is it the third? I can never remember since they did those roadworks. Maybe it's the first exit. Yes, it's definitely the first exit. Take the first exit. Bollocks. It was the second exit. Why didn't you say something? You anchor. Never mind. I know a shortcut. Follow the yellow brick road. Follow the yellow brick road. Follow, 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 follow the yellow brick road. Can you tell me how to get, how to get to Sesame Street? Take the bridge over troubled water. Winding your way down on Baker Street. You're on the road to hell. Stop. Hammer time. You have reached your destination. I did have a relationship with a satellite navigation system once, though. We used to go out all the time. They said it would never last the distance. We took a few wrong turns along the way. I thought we were heading in the right directions, but it turns out it was a one-way street. She just couldn't see the signs. We came to a crossroads. To be honest, I was sick of being told where to go. And she didn't like me being in the driving seat. We had turned a corner. We hit a dead end. And, just like that, our journey was over. People have often asked me why I want to put myself in a position where everyone can stare and laugh at me. The truth is that, it happens to me every day anyway. At least this way there's a scheduled time and place for it. <laughs> I like to think I'm providing a public service. Which is more than the government is doing at the moment. Of course. I do it because I want to be famous too. I think everyone does really. I started off in a disabled steps tribute band. We were called Bamps. That was a bit of an uphill struggle. I used to often think about going on The X Factor just to see the look on their faces when they realize I can't actually sing, or dance, or talk. I don't wonder about this anymore. The X Factor auditions came to the area recently, so obviously I went along to see what would happen. I thought I could be in with a chance because Gareth Gates became successful despite his SSSSSSSS stutter. <laughs> Choosing which song to sing to the judges was hard. Shout by Lulu was an obvious candidate, as was Don't Speak by No Doubt. But sometimes, I think I say it best when I say nothing at all. <laughs> In the end, I went for I believe I can fly. I'll be honest, I never even expected to reach the judges. 
Surely someone would question how the fuck I was going to sing. I did feel a little bit bad for wasting their time. Not much though. I'm a bastard. I could see straight away that they were very confused when I walked in. The look on their faces as I began to sing was priceless. Especially as I started to sway along to the words as well. Unsurprisingly they rejected me without even raising a smile. In fact, they still didn't smile as I walked out and asked them if it was because my voice had sounded too flat. Maybe I should have chosen a different song. Surely if Justin Timberlake can bring sexy back, then I can bring disability back too. I'd like to play you a clip of what I think would happen if I did go on the X Factor. Give me a second to find it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to face the music. Famous in six million countries, two million records sold in Nigeria. 32 number ones in Botswana. Banned from 65 international territories. Declared a public nuisance in 23 British cities. Recently released from prison. He fell out of the ugly tree and hit every damn branch on the way down. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Introduce Lost Voice Guy. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. I think about it every night and day. Spread my wings and fly away. I believe I can fly. I believe I can fly. I believe I can fly. Ladies and gentlemen, I have been Lost Voice Guy. If you find my voice, please contact me on my website or on my Facebook page. I hope you enjoy the rest of your night. Goodbye. questions uh, <laughs> and uh, actually I haven't checked the time but um, I might get told off for too late um, we could have some have we got time uh, questions from the floor if anyone's got anything that they would like to ask Lee or Lost Voice Guy is anyone feeling brave okay we've got Lynn over there wait you've got to wait for the mic it's on the mic oh Lynn was first pay attention Tom. over there you went near that. Oh, I just can't get to start yeah, I'd just like to hear your comebacks, please. <laughs> <laughs> I won't heckle you. <laughs> well done. You've just won our own personal game of retarded top trumps. <laughs> I'm sure your family is very proud. Shall we get on with the show now? I'll be honest, I'm using a crappy Apple product so the battery life isn't really very long. I'd hate to waste it on you, so please can we get on with the show. <laughs> that 
word correcting the pronunciation. Why don't we just start a move here to start calling it the iPad? And then it'll save you all the time. That'd be perfect. <laughs> Any other from the floor? No? Okay, great. Well, um, I can safely say that's uh, definitely the funniest um, start to CMB that I've ever seen. <laughs>